Good evening again, and welcome to the 2022 Mid-Hudson Scholastic Arts Award Ceremony. I'm Sue Ziers, and I'll be your host for this evening's event. We're here to celebrate these young artist accomplishments of winning gold and silver, silver key awards. The works you will, you will view tonight exemplifies the award's core values, originality, technical skill, and the emergence of a personal vision or voice. We awarded 242 silver keys, 175 gold keys, and five American vision winners. As we know, this year was another challenging one for all of us, but we are truly grateful for these young artists' hard work, talents, and willingness to share their perspectives with the world. The pandemic may have changed the way we celebrate the awards this evening, but we are here to share the art with your community, family, and teachers. We have a special guest I'm excited to introduce, Alan Rubin, professional painter and sculptor who calls Sullivan County, New York, his home. Alan is here with us tonight and wanted to share his story through video. We're going to play the video Alan created just for us. And uh, once the video has played, Alan is here to answer any questions that uh, anyone from the audience has. So if while you're watching the video, if you have any questions you'd like to ask Alan, if you can please throw those in the chat and uh, we will ask Alan those once the award ceremony has, uh, or once his video has concluded. Hello. I was never awarded a Scholastic Arts Award, but I did receive a similar medal from the Youth Friends Association when I was a teenager. So I appreciate the positive sense of support it affords. Being asked to do this keynote talk is a rare recognition, and I feel honored and grateful for the opportunity. For the past 32 years, I've lived in a former farmhouse and worked in a studio that was a chicken coop on a former chicken farm in Sullivan County, New York. It's an artist's paradise. To paraphrase David Byrne, is this my beautiful house? Is this my beautiful wife? Is this my beautiful studio? How did I get here? I was a middle child of a middle-class family in the middle of Brooklyn, New York. From kindergarten, I was recognized as having natural art abilities. From then on, I was considered the class artist. The positive feedback felt like love, so I kept at it. I won awards and was given special projects that got me out of regular classes. It made me feel popular among my friends. In high school, I had a wonderful art teacher named Mrs. Sabin, who encouraged me to apply to the Cooper Union, arguably the best art college in the U.S., and with free tuition, which got my parents on board. Here is some work from that time. My parents expected me to become a commercial illustrator, but at Cooper everything changed. I caught the fine art bug and forgot about the money-making part, to their chagrin. When I graduated, they said, adios, you're on your own. So from the age of 21, I had to support myself. Most importantly, at Cooper, I met Candy, my life partner for the past 52 years. Having a fellow artist to share the ups and downs of a dubious career choice while pursuing the activity that gave me the most pleasure was critical to my happiness. I think drawing is vital to any pursuit as an artist. Drawing teaches you how to look. There are techniques in drawing that train your brain to search for the truth. You may be a conceptual genius, but you ignore drawing at your peril. Immediately after college, I was forced to get jobs to support my painting addiction. I painted houses, apartments, and businesses. I did wallpaper, carpentry, and electrical jobs. I marketed the skills an artist gains in school. Ultimately, I recognized that my artist skills were more valuable to famous artists, including Robert Motherwell, Chuck Close, and Tom Wesselman, who would pay well for studio assistance and allow flexible hours. I never worked full-time, and I never stopped producing my own work. 
Out of school, my early paintings were surrealist, putting unexpected scenes together. After a few years working, I won a National Endowment for the Arts grant, which allowed me to paint full-time. I began to sell paintings in galleries and from my studio. Not long after that, I risked sabotaging my career by switching to abstracted aerial cityscapes. My career survived, and I supported myself by art for a number of years. Then suddenly it all crashed because of greedy landlords and my gallery going out of business. Three different living and working lofts led to lawsuits, evictions, harassment, and ultimately to self-exile from New York City and escape to upstate New York. Commuting to part-time city employment, working for Tom Wesselman for 20 years. Until 2004, when we left our jobs and the city for good. In the country, I changed my aerial cityscapes to aerial country landscapes. I made them three-dimensional and topographical and more abstract. Eventually, I became lonely for human figures and changed again, building abstract portraits of my family and friends to keep me company while working alone each day in my studio. I fashioned them from branches I found in my woods and stretched canvas over their skeletons. I painted them in an abstract and expressionist fashion. Influenced by primitive tribal art, I was exposed to during our extensive travels in Europe, South America, and Asia. Here are paintings I made during stays in Bali, Indonesia. The work I make now can be called painted sculpture. I find images of self-portraits made by well-known and less-known painters from the history of art. I love these self-portraits because they depict artists in the act of creation. I take these flat paintings and recycle them into sculptures made from recycled metal and cans that I gather from my kitchen, from leftover chicken farm detritus, and from donations from friends in local restaurants. Then I paint them as close to the original as possible, learning the style of each artist, so I can project onto the other side how they would have painted the entire sculpture. When done, I add them to the growing personal museum I am creating of paintings by artists that I enjoy. I have finished 140 in five and a half years. They have become my personal canon, defined as a body of works of indisputable quality, an ideal standard by which other things are measured. When I noticed the pun of can in the word canon, I knew it would have to be the title of the series. My art education left out many artists of non-male, non-white, non-American European persuasion. I am trying to correct that in my own canon by including an equal number of female artists and as many self-portraits as I can Google from various other cultures. It's my hope that someday my museum will end up in an actual museum. I started out painting very representational images. Along the way I deviated toward abstraction, thinking it to be a higher form of art. Now I have returned to my roots, learning anew how to paint by copying and interpreting the work of the masters. Wolf Kahn, one of my friendly advisors, asked me why I was always trying to solve problems in my work. He advised me to just figure out what you are good at and keep doing it. I scoffed at that then, but now I wonder. Honestly, I am not good at self-promotion. Throughout my art career, I did everything required to reach out to obtain gallery representation. I sent out slides, made influential connections, networked, posted on websites, built a resume of exhibitions, articles, curatorships. I learned that, for me, that was not the main pleasure of art making. 
When Candy and I relocated home and studios from Manhattan to the country, I wondered if we were giving up on making it in the art world. Candy said it didn't matter, because making it meant making the art. She was right. We have ample space and time to create and a large community of fellow artists to share with. We have exhibited extensively in local galleries and museums. There are articles about me if you Google me. Success is relative and not for everyone. I feel successful as an artist because I have spent my whole life creating and sharing my art. Sometimes I made a living from it. Mostly I supported my art doing other work. Most people do the job so they can make a living. I made a living so I could do the job. I have no complaints about my choices. I invite you to visit my Instagram page at alanrubin12 to see all the canon with examples of the originals and my working process. At facebook.com slash alanrubinart you can see the same plus a retrospective of past decades of my work going back to the 1960s. There is a video of me working on a sculpture for the canon. The artwork says more about me than any words I can write. In conclusion, I have lived an artist's life, but each artist's life is singular and must be created. Every artist has a different story. The skills of art making can be learned and taught, but the motivation, discipline, and commitment must well up from the heart and soul of the person. You can't do it alone. You need supporters, mentors. Find people who can help you. Help others in turn. Make art your community. Treat it like you would your spiritual calling. Thank you. I thank Alan for creating that wonderful video and sharing all of those amazing uh, pieces. Is there any questions? Um, please put them in the chat. I'll give you a few moments to um, type those out if anyone has any questions. For Alan, he is here live on the line. You can see me. He's in his studio, his beautiful studio. No, this is in my house. Oh, this is your house. Oh, okay. Um, it's where we hang other people's art. I'm sorry. Haley, you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay, um, so what would you recommend for artists who want to, um, I guess, like, want to experiment more, but don't think they're going to, you know, like, end up liking the results? Because I've been wanting to experiment with different mediums for a while, or so I'm just kind of scared of the results. Uh, I think you know the answer to this. Do the experiment. If you like it, show it to somebody else. If they like it, keep doing it. If nobody likes it, maybe look for another experiment. Kind of obvious. Thank you so much. Uh, You're welcome. So I have a question in the chat. How long did it take to find your style? Well, since my style has changed regularly throughout my career, it, it uh, anytime I got tired of doing what I was doing, I would try something new, like the uh, last questioner was asking about. So um, it wasn't like I reached a point. It was, it was a, a, a journey. Uh, next question is, how did going to Cooper push you out of your comfort zone? Oh, that's easy. Um, I was, a I was the youngest person in the class, except for one other. I was uh, 17 years old when I started Cooper. Everyone else was much older because they were staying in college to keep out of the army because it was the Vietnam War. And so I felt very outclassed by all my friends, by all my classmates. I thought that uh, they had way more experience than I did. And uh, what I did was I, I intuited that I should just start acting like I was on their level and pretending I was on their level. And maybe they would treat me like I was on their level while I played catch up to reach their level. And it, it took a while. It took a year or two. 
and I started getting the kind of respect that I was giving to them and hoping to get. So that was the process. Fake it till you make it. <laughs> I love those words of advice. Uh, next question. How do you t determine whether you're going to create an abstract piece or a more technical piece? I'm not sure I understand because there's almost all the abstraction I've ever done has been representational in one way or another. And uh, as far as technical piece, I don't know what that means. Um, I seem to I'd right now be doing representational work because I'm representing the either representational or abstract work that other people did. So I, right now I consider myself a representational artist all the time. I've never done pure abstract. Uh, what motivated you to convert 2D portraits into 3D sculptures? Well, I was doing those landscapes, those aerial landscapes, and uh, I was looking for a more per a small way to make a permanent uh, little sculpture that was already 3D. And I uh, started working with metal a little bit. And then a local um, uh, art director uh, had, a, had a regular show called Art in Sixes. That's Rocky Pinciotti at the Delaware Valley Arts Alliance. And, and uh, everything had to be either six inches, fit within a six inch three dimensions. And uh, I looked around for something I could do that would fit in six inches. And I looked at a tomato can and I said, well, that's six inches. Maybe I could make that into a portrait. It was, it was really as silly as that. And I started making portraits out of tomato cans for fun. And people kept patting me on the back and saying, do this, keep doing this. And uh, eventually I agreed. What has been your biggest fear as an artist? <laughs> that all my work at the end of my life of creating will go uh, not to a museum collection, but to the dumpster collection. Well, I don't think that will happen. <laughs> I don't think anyone on this uh, uh, call this evening it, thinks so either. My, my concept of how you know if art is, is worthwhile or not is will people throw it away? And if people won't throw it away, they hold it and they say, I can't throw this away. That, that pretty much says that you've made something worthy. What was your biggest inspiration as a teenager? Well, I was still a teenager when I started college and I had my classmates. And my classmates, who I said were way ahead of me, they knew about art in a way that I didn't know. I knew how to make things, but I didn't know about the masters. I hadn't learned art history yet. So uh, learning from my classmates was even more important than learning from my teachers. And then when I traveled to Europe, when I was 19 years old, I spent the whole summer in Europe just hitchhiking around, taking trains and going from museum to museum. And I learned art history the, uh, the good way seeing it live in person. That was my greatest inspiration. Any tips for stretching canvas into abstract 3D forms you made mid-career? Don't even try. <laughs> I am the greatest canvas stretcher who has ever lived. And you just, you, you, you'll never catch me. <laughs> I did it for a living. I did it for a living for 35 years. Give it up. No, it's, it's practice, practice, practice. Have you ever had to deal with people copying or using your art as their own? If so, how do you deal with it? That happens to some people. Uh, I always tried to make things that were unique and that other people either wouldn't want to make or could not make hence the canvas stretching. I knew how difficult that was. And so I thought I was making things that would be mine alone. Of course, that doesn't get you into a lot of group shows because you're not part of a group. 
So um, one time I didn't even invite someone else who did aerial views, uh, a famous artist who wanted to come to my studio. I uh, cut off uh, communication with that person because I was afraid she would steal my ideas. So uh, I can't recommend that, uh, but it has been my experience. Looking back, what do you value most while at art school? And is there anything you would have done differently? I valued, like I said, my classmates and the concept of what it's like to be an artist. I value the art history I learned, learning about the masters, even though my art history teacher was a total bore. Uh, I valued the sense of motivation I got from being left alone to do my own work because my teachers pretty much threw up their hands and said, I guess you know what you're doing, just keep doing it. Did I answer the question? You did, yes. What was your favorite portrait you've created as a sculpture and why? Well, my current favorite is the blue one that you can see. Um, called, uh, done by Remedios Vado. Remedios Vado was a surrealist painter who hung out with Frida Kahlo and the surrealist group in Mexico. And I, I used so many different objects. So, you know, pieces of chicken farm uh, feeding plates and, 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 and wire and, and, and uh, lids and cans. And so much went into that. And it looks so much like the original, it feels so much like the original that I, I, I think the energy that I put into it is very re rewarding for me. So that's my favorite right now. But of course, then the, the favorite is usually the last one you made anyway. Have you ever had to overcome perfectionism? If yes, how? Fortunately, no, I've, I've always been a perfectionist. No, you don't, you don't overcome perfectionism, you, you, you nurture it. What, may, what do you think makes you a good artist? Uh, um, that, that for me, it's my life. And I've done the work that I've needed to do to make it come out the way I want it to come out. So, um, you know, they say it's 10% uh, inspiration and 90% perspiration. I've worked hard and, uh, and I love it. I love every minute of it. It's the happiest time of the day and it's meditative and there's nothing better than working in your studio and losing the hours to something called flow state, which is when you're in the groove and you are, you feel divinely inspired and, uh, you, you can do no wrong. That's what you're working towards. Shoot for that and you'll, you'll be happy your whole life. Do you have any tips for making landscapes or cityscapes? Use your eyes, look, look really hard and learn the, uh, le learn the academic ability of measuring and how to, uh, like I said, how to draw how to turn line into uh, form uh, because you have, uh, two you have two eyes and a two dimensional surface. Your eyes see three dimensionals. So drawing and painting teaches you how to use your three dimensional eyes through your, two through your hand to create the appearance of three dimensions on your two dimensional surface. Uh, it's, it's all about learning the ropes. What is a piece of advice you wanted to hear when you were younger? That I didn't have to worry about the money. <laughs> <laughs> that I didn't have to worry about being a rich and famous artist because only one in a thousand or one in a million ever get to that. Uh, so uh, when I would say I didn't care about money, people would, would laugh at me and say, oh, yes, you will. Oh, yes, you do. And uh, so the best advice was to uh, find a way to support yourself and do what you love. 
any last questions before we wrap with, uh, with Alan here? Nobody's gonna ask me how long it takes to make one? <laughs> well, I think you should share that. Uh, what I always say is um, 72 years, but next month it will be 73 years. That's how long it takes. Uh, we have a, a last a last moment question here. Do you enjoy working with metal or canvas more? Uh, right now, I'm really enjoying metal. I, I have a feel for the um, the tolerances of metal. I always have. When I worked for uh, Tom Wesselman, I was the only person allowed to bend the metal pieces. So. Um, I seem to be able to do things with metal that other people scratch their heads and say, how do you do that? And for me, it comes easy. So um, metal for now, I'm not going back to canvas, metal. Thanks for asking all those interesting questions. I didn't expect it, thank you. Uh, we have a few others. Do you mind uh, sticking on the line a little longer, Alan? I already ate dinner. I'm, I'm here for you. Great. Thank you. Uh, was your wife uh, always inspiring you? Absolutely. She's a better painter than I am. Uh, she taught me to draw the way she learned to draw in school because I didn't have the same drawing teachers. Uh, and her commitment to being an artist is greater than mine even. So yeah, she inspires me and shares and supports me and vice versa. Her studio is even bigger than mine. <laughs> and what has been your favorite creation? I think I answered that already. Oh, my favorite creation? No, it's the totality. You, you, can't, uh, you can't pick favorites. It's like picking your favorite child. You can't do that. And I don't have any children. So that's one creation I didn't undertake. Uh, how, has your, how has the business of art changed since you've become an artist? When I was young, a young person like me could break into the art world. Uh, I even put it off for a few years because I didn't feel any pressure. And as, as time progressed, the art world became more and more uh, mercenary and business oriented and product oriented and merchandise oriented. And uh, it was always that to some extent, but there weren't so many artists then. Uh, the people I worked for, they had to compete with 150 people. I had to compete with, to compete with uh, a few thousand people. Now you're competing with millions of people and they're just looking for something to sell. So it's, it's a it's not a pleasant business, just like a lot of business, like the music business. Um, so you have to find uh, a pleasure in it beyond whether or not you'll be successful business-wise. Although some people are very good at that. I'm not. Oops. Oops, lost you, Susan. Has art given you any opportunities you never thought you'd get? All the opportunities I've ever had have come from art. The travel, um, because I was a studio assistant, I traveled to Japan, Germany. Candy and I went to Japan and Germany and, and, and uh, all around Europe. We, uh, because of art, we went to museums in, in Asia and uh, in South America. And it, the art is what tempted us to go everywhere and see everything. And uh, it created the opportunity and, and the, the inspiration to do things. Um, and, and so, yeah, the, the travel. Do you think you would have evolved in the same way if you didn't move to Sullivan County? I would have been struggling with difficulties in the city, uh, but nothing was ever going to stop me from working. So I guess the answer is yes. Oh, I might not have been doing cans, though. <laughs> <laughs> and that is amazing what you're what you're currently working on. So impressed. Thank you. Uh, 
there's a question about um, showing in local galleries. And actually at this point, uh, where Donna is going to share uh, Alan's uh, Facebook page and also his Instagram account into the chat. So um, we thank you all, Alan. We really thank you for sharing your journey with us. Um, it is interesting and an amazing 73 years. Mm. Uh, thank you for, uh, for joining us tonight. And uh, all of you that are with us tonight, please uh, follow Alan on his journey. Uh, he's always making uh, new, new things. So, um, and he does uh, keep his uh, accounts active. So uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, at this right. thank, time, thank you for the opportunity to, to share with the public. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, at this point, I'd just like to thank um, some folks who really help uh, help us out in uh, creating this show. It is uh, a, a large undertaking. Um, and the first folks I'd like to thank is the Orange Arts Council, Council and the Catskill Arts Society for helping me find all the professional artists who help us adjudicate um, this show. Of course, all of the art teachers who work hours with our students and encourage our students to participate in the arts and for all the behind the scenes work that our uh, teachers do to uh, help us produce this show. A special thanks to um, our Scholastic Arts Committee, Janet Ferrara from Middletown and Large City School District, Maria DeWald from Duchess Boces, Sarah McKay from the Orange Arts Council, and Jessica Frankie and Donna Hemmer from Sullivan County BOCES. We could not do this uh, event without all of those extra hands. On behalf of the Hudson Valley Alliance, thank you for your time, help and support and sharing all your amazing ideas with us. And last but not least, of course, congratulations to our winners tonight. You have now entered into the prestigious Alumni Association of the Scholastic Arts Awards. Congratulations. At this time, we are going to uh, share a link to our virtual galleries. So the link will not open uh, to the public until tomorrow morning. So please, uh, before you uh, get off the line with us this evening, please make a copy and save it somewhere so that um, you can view it uh, this evening and if, once we get off the line. There are instructions on the website on how to navigate the galleries. And there is a uh, nine galleries with uh, the various works in them. So at this time, you are welcome. Uh, there is the link in the chat. And if you would like to go and uh, peruse all of the galleries, there is a um, like button on the galleries. So if you, if you are enjoying your experience tonight, please uh, make sure you like our galleries. So thank you again for joining us. And I will stay here on the line if there is any other questions on how to get to the galleries. But um, thank you for joining us and enjoy the virtual experience of the galleries. I hope uh, you enjoy them as much as we have.